So I would like to welcome all of you who are listening today to our webinar. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Dairyman Magazine. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to co-host this webinar with Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. We are fortunate to have a fantastic speaker on our agenda today. His name is Bill Weiss, and he comes to us from The Ohio State University. His presentation is titled, Improved Method Methods for Comparing the Economic Value of Feed. As we all know, feed is one of the most expensive parts of a dairy farm, if not the most expensive, and it's critical to select ingredients that make nutritional and financial sense for each dairy. Dr. Weiss will walk us through how to make some of those comparisons, and we look forward to hearing what he has to say on this topic today. Our sponsor for this webinar is QLF Quality Liquid Feeds, and we're very pleased to have their support of this program so that we can provide it for all of you in the audience today. I would like to thank our other team members, Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois, and our Horde Steryman online media manager, Patty Herchin, who helped make sure everything runs smoothly every month. I would also, um, once again, like to thank our sponsor, QLF, for supporting our program for today. If you're listening to our presentation live, you can print out a copy of the handouts and keep those for future reference or take notes on them as Dr. Weiss presents. You can find those at the handouts tab in the go to webinar control panel. Um, down at the bottom, it'll say handouts, and you can click on those PDFs and print one out for your reference. Also, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please type them into the questions section of the go to webinar control panel and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Mike, if you would please go ahead and further introduce Dr. Weiss so that we can get started on this month's webinar. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and it's my professional and actually personal honor to introduce our, our speaker today, Dr. Bill Weiss. As Abby mentioned, he is Professor of Dairy Cattle Nutrition at the Department of Animal Sciences at The Ohio State University located at Worcester. Uh, Bill earned his uh, bachelor's and master's degree from Purdue University and then his PhD from The Ohio State University. He then had uh, an opportunity to teach and be assistant professor at North Dakota State University and he's been on the faculty at Ohio State since 1988. Uh, he has a number of different areas, you'll hear one of those here today. I won't walk through all the ones, but he's been very prolific in terms of journal articles and popular press uh, presentations as well. And I think this may be his sixth presentation here on the Hordes webinar. Uh, he was a member of the 2001 Dairy NRC Committee, and he did such a wonderful job. He became co-chairman of the 2016 NRC Committee, and that is going to be out sometime in 2021, so we're looking forward to that. So, uh, Professor uh, Weiss, thank you very much for joining us today, and we'll turn the program over to you. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Abby. It's a pleasure to be back with Hordes. Um, I want to start off first by acknowledging a co-author of, of, of this presentation, Alex Tabby, or Dr. Alex Tabby. When he was uh, getting his degree here at Ohio State, he helped quite a bit on developing some of the stuff we'll be talking about. And I also just want to throw in a disclaimer here. I'm going to be giving a lot of prices. And as we all know, markets change constantly. There are geographic difference, time difference, et cetera. So milk prices, feed prices change. So I don't want you to think that I give if when I give a number that that's the absolute number. It was correct at one time for one location, but it's not correct all the time or at all locations. So I'm really giving numbers as examples rather than absolutes. So, so enough, enough disclaimers, we'll get into the, the meat of this. When, if you're putting together a diet, there's a ton of different feeds. I, I added up 150, and there's probably more than that in the U.S. If you throw in across the world, it would go up even more. There's lots of things to consider. One is, is it available? You know, this is a picture from Costa Rica. Cold bananas are common. They're not so common in, in, in Ohio. So is the feed available? What's the nutrient composition? What, and we'll talk a lot about this. The quality, consistency, uh, services supplier, these are kind of intangible. And they're very important, but they're very hard to price. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention these, but these are something you have to consider kind of independent of the other things I'm talking about. And then lastly is the price. So we're gonna hit, hit on how you take this information and come up and make good feed choice decisions. 
They're going to start with a, a, an easy question here. They, the, the questions do get tougher as time goes by. So I'm turning it over to Mike for a minute. Okay, very good. We are going to uh, look at our first question here. And uh, the, the question is, uh, what are your best way to compare feed prices? So you're ready to vote and vote early. We're going to go fast here. Well, you have four choices, uh, cost per ton, uh, cost per ton of dry matter, the uh, value based on the nutrient supplied, or none of the above. So we are now uh, got the poll open and uh, we're off and running. And we've got uh, about 56% uh, of the vote in and still climbing. And uh, you got to vote now. Abby, you want to vote on this one? I will choose the second answer, ton, tons of dry matter. All right. I'm going to go with number three, based okay. uh, value based on new supply. None of the above uh, could probably be politically correct as well. Okay, let's go ahead and close the, vo the poll. And uh, Dr. Weiss, what do you think of the answers here? Well, we're going to talk about this in just a minute. The, the absolute correct answer is none of the above. The value based is probably right enough, but this seminar is really going to talk about how we have to adjust this nutrient supplied basis. So let's let's start with an example here. These are reasonable numbers. We got two feeds. This is the price per ton of dry matter. I think if I asked you which one you're going to feed, I think it'd be a very easy answer. But now let's let's look on a nutrient basis. If we price this per pound of crude protein, Feed B is still substantially more expensive, but it's not nearly as bad as price per ton. But if we get down even further, and this is uh, an RP methionine, this is soybean meal, if we price it per pound of metabolizable methionine, this becomes a very reasonable price. It's, it's actually cheaper than soybean meal. But this type of comparison is not appropriate because that's saying, the only thing soybean meal is good for is methionine, and we know that's not true. It provides energy, it provides other amino acids. So you, you really cannot compare feeds based on a single nutrient, unless that's the only nutrient in the feed. So, but, but we have to base it on nutrients, and we have to base it on all the nutrients, all the important nutrients that a feed provides. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about. And the basic approach we use, this is the starting point, we get more complicated. We break feed down into, into, into nutrients. And depending on what your, your system is, um, it's the nutrients that you use to formulate a diet in a certain situation. In this example, I'm formulating for energy, metabolizable protein, forage NDF. You could add stuff. You could add calcium, phosphorus, whatever you want. So to price a feed, we see how much energy, I'm going to do everything on a ton basis here. So how much energy is in a ton of this feed? And what's the price of energy? Not the price of the feed, but the price of energy. How much MP is in a ton? What's the price of MP? How much forage NDF, et cetera? So we just add these up. You need to get this information. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you add them up and say, that's what this feed is worth. As we get more complicated, you might be formulating diets for methionine, lysine, other things, and then you would price lysine and methionine. So you price the nutrients that you're formulating for. For this webinar, mostly I'm going to be talking about MP, but realize you can add additional nutrients as long as you have the composition data. That's, that's critical. You need to know how much metabolizable methionine is provided by the feed, etc. You have to have composition data. And that's the basic approach that, that uh, Norman St. Pierre devel developed many, many years ago. But what I'm going to really concentrate on, not so much this, this base here, but on ways we need to adjust it. For some feeds, this doesn't work well. We have to make adjustments. Okay, a few few disclaimers here on what I'm going to talk about. First of all, you have to compare. When you're comparing feeds, you have to compare within a market. Um, so I'm going to be using Midwest and Ohio prices. I did this, I, I ran this about a, a month ago, and I actually did that on purpose because I wanted it to be an example, not real, real necessarily correct numbers. And you also have to consider transportation. All the prices should be delivered to the farm. You know, if, if hay is $200 in Idaho, but it's going to cost me uh, $250 to get it to Ohio, I use the $250. You 
you price the feed at the farm. And to be really correct, on some feeds, for example, wet distillers or wet brewers or a wet feed, you probably should also incorporate some shrink because you know you're not going to be able to feed all that. But make sure all feeds are priced the same. Transportation added in, then the same market. And then, so the next question is, what you, you, you got the market, what nutrients? Well, you need to pick the right ones. You can put a whole bunch in. You can put every essential nutrient in these things, but you're going to get very strange answers. So you really need to kind of limit it to some key, in, key nutrients, which I'll discuss. These key nutrients really should account for most of the value of a feed. Manganese, for example, is an essential nutrient, but the price of soybean meal really doesn't depend on whether it has a lot of manganese or not much manganese. So what nutrients account for most of the value of the feeds? And again, you have to be able to get that number, the composition number. <clears throat> uh, labs must be able to measure it or estimate it. Because if, if they can't, then you start wondering, am I pricing this correctly if I really don't know what's in these feeds. So this is, this is from Ohio, but I have no reason to doubt this isn't very similar across the US and probably across the world. For a, a, a lactating cow, about half the feed cost goes to feed energy. These are for lactating cows. So about half goes to feed, feed energy. About a third is for protein, give or take a little bit. And this will vary, you know, when soybean meal prices go up, it goes up and goes down. But about a third of total feed costs are for a protein. Cows are ruminants. They need fiber and they need effective fiber. I'm going to use the term forage fiber rather than effective fiber because this is, is easy to, to define and measure. When you start talking about effective fiber, you have to come up with effectiveness values, and that gets to be more difficult. <clears throat> but you can price it on forage fiber, and non-forage fiber really doesn't have any independent value. It provides energy, but it's not an essential nutrient, whereas forage fiber is an essential nutrient. So if we use energy, and I'm going to use NEL, if we use protein, I'm going to use MP, and forage fiber, we account for the vast majority of economic value of, of most feeds. So that's the ones, again, I'm going to co concentrate on. But realize you can add additional nutrients. So I said you need to be able to measure this stuff. Fiber NDF is easy. You, the lab measures that every day. So that's no issue. But energy and protein are, are more difficult. They're, these these nutrients are actually diet nutrients. They are not feed nutrients. In other words, a feed does not have an MP value. MP is a function of the energy in the diet, RDP in the diet, and RUP in the diet, not in the feed. Energy is also a function of the diet, but not as much as MP, but it's still the function of the diet. So we have to, to get these numbers, we have to make some assumptions. And so the assumptions I make is that these feeds are going to be put into a good diet, a reasonably balanced diet. It's not necessarily perfect, but a reasonably balanced diet. And if I make that assumption, I can just say, okay, I'm going to have a standard discount for NEL. The diet's not going to produce acidosis, so on. I'm just going to say it's a good diet. Uh, and for example, we just take, if you're using NRC, you use the NRC, you discount it to the 3X, and you just use those numbers for everything. You can use other models, just discount everything to a common diet. Don't, don't make adjustments, uh, discount feeds differently. Just make an assumption that the diet is going to be a good diet. For MP, this is more difficult. Because again, we have RDP, which is converted into microbial protein, and then we have RUP. The conversion of RDP into metabolizable protein is a function of energy supply. Total diet energy, not the energy in the feed, but the energy in the diet. So to get this to work, what I assume is that 
energy is the limiting factor here, that there's going to be enough RDP uh, to, to meet requirements. And actually, I'm going to say there's actually a 5% excess. Because that's if you look at a lot of diets, that's it's not uncommon that we feed about 5% extra RDP. So if you make this assumption, again, using the NRC model, this will be different for other models. But I'm going to assume we, we capture RDP at about 52% which I think, again, is a reasonable assumption. So what, I, what I've come up with here is you can get crude protein measured in a lab for these individual feeds, and these are just example feeds here. Labs cannot measure MP. They will not, cannot give you that number. But if you assume this, this equation, which I, I discussed just a second ago, you get an RDP value. This can either be a lab estimate or go to a book. You multiply that by 52% or 0.52. You get RUP from the lab or from a book. You multiply it by its digestibility. And this can be measured in labs now or a book. And then you just sum those up, and that's, that's the efficiency. For these forages here, I've got alfalfa and corn silage. The crude protein, these are the estimated MPs. And you can see the efficiency for forages is around 57%. And actually, that's what I rounded off for forages. It's crude protein times 0.57. That's my MP for forages. For, for concentrates, because this RUP digestibility can change and the proportion of RUP and RDP can change a lot, you, you've got to calculate numbers for ex, individual numbers for individual feeds. You can't use a use a generic number like for forages. So you see bean meal here at 71. So it's 54 times 0.71 gives you the MP. Average distillers has an efficiency of 66. So take the crude protein value, calculate the efficiency, and estimate MP for the feed. So you've got now the nutrient composition, the energy, the protein, um, if you're doing amino acids, et cetera. Now what you need is to get the price of the nutrient. And Norman uh, St. Pierre back in 2000 published this, this paper, and it generates basically what he uses, what's called least squares maximum likelihood estimation. And I know most of you would like to hear about this for hours and hours, but I'm going to skip it. Just think this is kind of like regression. You put in a bunch of feeds with a bunch of nutrients with their price. And what this program does is simply partition the price into the nutrients based on regression techniques. So it's going to generate a mean nutrient price. It's going to say energy on average costs 10 cents a megacalorie or whatever. But it's also going to give a plus minus value. This is a statistical technique. It's not an absolute. So it's going to say energy is worth 10 cents plus or minus one cent or whatever. So when you, when you generate nutrient cost, you should look at the average prices. The average value of the nutrient is this, but it's plus or minus something. And the plus or minus is important. Some people have asked, can you get this program? Yeah, yes, you can. It's free. Um, this is on the handout, but it's also just here. Uh, click here. You, it takes you to someplace else. Download it. Read the instructions. Uh, it's free again. You need a username and a password. I can't remember what it is, but it is on the web page. If, if you go here, read the instructions, it will give you the username and the password. Don't, however, do not ask me how to run the program. That's what Norman was for. I don't know how to run it, actually. I know how to interpret it. I don't know how to run it. So in, in uh, October, we ran uh, prices here mid, using Midwest markets. And you can see here energy when we did this was worth $0.08 cents per megacal. Plus or minus about $0.02. Cents. And again, this is the uncertainty. So it could be 10 cents for energy or it could be six cents. MP was priced at 47 cents a pound, plus or minus about a nickel. Effective fiber, and again, I use tend to use forage fiber. It comes out very similar. Usually it's worth seven cents. 
And you'll see this non-effective fiber is actually worth negative six cents. And you can say, how can that be negative? Well, you have to think of the feeds that provide a lot of this, like distillers, gluten, soy hulls. These feeds have very little value for swine and poultry. And, and Mark, feed prices are not dependent on dairy. You know, it's, it's all animals eat, eat corn and all animals eat soybean meal. But since high fiber byproducts typically can only be fed to cattle, poultry doesn't want them, swine doesn't want them. So the market actually has to sell these at something less than what they're worth just based on, on, on these numbers. Because again, it's, it's a worldwide across species discount or market. So this just says high fiber byproducts are worth less than, than non-high fiber byproducts. And it is usually negative, not always, but usually negative. Okay, to just give a quick example here, I've got alfalfa hay. This is the nutrient composition I got from the lab. It's 85% dry matter, 6,2 energy. It was 23% crude protein, so using my conversion, I get 13. It was 40% NDF, and it's all effective. <clears throat> So we price things on an as-fed as basis. So I got to calculate how much dry matter is in a ton. I have to calculate how much energy is in that ton, not of dry matter now, but that ton of as-fed. And there's about 1,000 megacals of energy in that ton of hay. There's about 221 pounds of MP in that ton, 680 pounds of NDF. You get the prices, which I just showed and you just multiply them out here. So on energy, that one ton of alfalfa hay had about $84 of energy, about 104 bucks worth of, of MP, 47 or $48 worth of fiber. And you add these up and on a nutrient basis, this isn't the selling price or the buying price, this is on a nutrient basis, it's worth about 236 a ton. If you could buy it at 236, you're getting your money's worth. And remember, there is um, there is uncertainty. This is so we look at 235, but it's plus or minus something. So if it's within that plus or minus range, you could say it's a a, a good or a break even buy. And just as an example here, I've got I've got some different feeds, and this was priced again in, in October. If we started distillers, there, let me the 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 scarlet boxes here are the nutrient value. And again, there are boxes because there's uncertainty. In the middle of the box would be the average value of the nutrients, but the whole box includes the plus or minus. So if we look at distillers here, it was worth on a nutrient basis somewhere between 220 and about 260 a ton. But it was selling for about 190. So what that is telling me, I could buy about $240 worth of nutrients for only $190. That's a bargain. If we look at alfalfa hay, it was selling for roughly $220, but it's, it only averages about $190 worth of nutrients. Hay was alfalfa hay was overpriced. If we look at bud meal, it was selling for about 700 bucks, and the, the nutrient value was somewhere between about 650 and 720. It's a break even, or we, you're getting what you pay for. So you can see some, some feeds are bargains, some are overpriced, and some are break even. And, and these change, of course, with, with markets. So how do you interpret this? Well, some people say, well, bargain feeds, I'm always going to use them. They're, they're cheap. That, that's not what you want to do. You want to consider them, but that doesn't mean you want to use them. First of all, the, the feed has to fit your diet. And, and an example I use, if you've got a lot of alfalfa, your forage is going to be high in protein. Gluten feed is high in protein or moderate in protein. Are you really going to get any value from that protein? Maybe not. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So remember, just because it's cheap doesn't mean you can feed a lot of it. And then again, these intangibles of quality, consistency, et cetera, which I can't price, but they're important. On the other hand, you might say, well, I'm never going to feed a high-priced or an overpriced feed. 
Well, that's not the right interpretation either. One is, remember nutrients. Are you pricing the nutrient, the right nutrient for that feed? You know, RP methionine would never be fed if you price it on an MP basis. You have to price it on methionine. Some feeds have different effects that we can't explain. And an example here is molasses sometimes is added to, to stick things together in the TMR. That has value, but I can't put a price on it. Other feeds do things that we don't understand. They do produce more than they should. We don't understand how to do that. I'm going to give an example of that. And then again, of course, the intangible. So here's an example with distillers. It's a bargain. It's almost always a bargain priced feed. Here's a study uh, we did a couple years ago um, where it fed a high inclusion rate, 30%. The price of distillers was 194 when, when I did my nutrients. It has a nutrient value of 244, so it's a great bargain. And when I looked at this study using their diets and current feed cost, this, this distiller diet saves me a buck 10 a day in feed costs. That's, that's a huge savings. That's not trivial. That is a huge saving. However, this 30% diet also lost me about a tenth of a pound of protein a day and seven tenths of a pound of protein, of, of fat a day. So I saved a buck 10 on feed, but I lost $2 in gross income in milk. So this bargain feed ended up costing me 90 cents a day. And if you do the math, at a 30% inclusion, this stuff would have had to sell for $110 for me to actually be, be a profitable addition. This is 30%. At 10%, a lot of times it works perfectly fine. So this doesn't mean don't feed distillers. It means cheap distillers at high inclusion rate really isn't that cheap. Feed it in moderation, and it would be a could be a, a very good buy. This is an example of pricing for nutrients. I said earlier, blood meal was break even when we price it on MP, energy, etc. However, if I price it for energy and amino acids, it becomes quite a bargain. The nutrient value now is up around a thousand dollars a ton when I price it on on amino acids, not the $700, it's selling for $700. It's a very good uh, buy if you're formulating for lysine methionine. So remember, if you're buying feeds, are you pricing it for what you're paying for or the nutrient you want? Then we get into this thing that ideally, any, for, any balanced diet that met the, the nutrient requirements of cow would do exactly the same. The, the ingredients would not matter one bit. That's, we would love to believe that, but that's not the case. We know certain ingredients do better or worse than other ingredients for reasons we may not understand. So for some feeds, nutrients do not adequately describe performance. And for those, we have to make adjustments. So I wanna run through a canola example. This is a, a data from a meta-analysis, and this is what I call empirically adjusting the price um, based on, on research production, research-based production differences. And to do this, you know, I'd like to have a, more than one study. I'd like to see a couple of studies that they're comparing feed X to feed Y and see what it does. Remember that diets in research, the diet they fed at a certain farm may be very different from yours. You might not see the same response. So just remember these are working with averages. The more studies that go into this, the more likely your average will work. And it is dependent on feed and milk price. So if we look at canola, when I did this, it was $60, about $60 overpriced. So you would never feed it, you'd feed bean meal. But if you look at that meta-analysis, on average, when they compared a bunch of studies with canola to mostly soy diets, they fed on average about 5.6 pounds of as-fed canola. Again, I'm pricing everything on as-fed. So 5.6 pounds as-fed. The cows fed this canola, ate about half a pound more. They produced more milk protein. They produced more milk fat than the controls. 
and you can can calculate what this is worth, what the added feed costs are, what the added net, uh, gross income for milk is. You have to take in the price, the factor that canola is expensive. So when you do all that, I come up with uh, canola. This 5.6 pounds of canola actually increased income over feed costs 13 cents a day. So you put this on a ton basis. The 13 divided by 5.6 times 2,000. Canola is, because of, for unknown reason, because of what it does for milk, is worth about $50 a ton more than the nutrients. So we, we take the nutrient price here at 248. We add what I'm going to call the production bonus, because I don't know why it's there. It's now worth 296. So now it's, it went from an overpriced feed to a break-even feed. You got what you paid for, even though if you just look at nutrients, you would never feed it. So when you're looking at different feeds, ask yourself, does this do better or worse than what we think? What about forages? Well, what we'd like to do with forages is measure something and correlate that to production and to see if we can adjust the, for the quality of forage. And that's what uh, really precipitated this webinar is adjustments for forages. So I'm going to take a quick break here and let Mike turn it over um, on till we when we switch into forages. So Mike, take take it away. Okay, Bill, take a quick break here. Uh, the question is, uh, when hay is priced uh, either RFQ relative uh, forage quality index or RFV relative forage value, which one of the following is correct? And you have four choices here. First one is more energy. Uh, RFQ uh, equals hay is worth more. Uh, more fiber. Uh, RFQ equals more dollars. Third, more protein. RFQ equals more dollars. Number four, if you can't figure this out, vote for all the above are correct. I don't think that's, I think that's, I think that one's wrong, but I don't want to, I don't want to bias the vote here, but let's go ahead and vote here. So we're off and running there. Uh, Abby, do you want to take a swing at this? This is a little, a uh, little more exciting. Uh, yeah, I, Bill has some good questions today. I, you know, I think I'm going to go with all of the above, even though that wasn't what you were thinking, Mike, but that's where I'm going to go with this one. Well, I'm going to vote for number one, but I can't see the vote yet. So we'll, We'll 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 see uh, at this point. We are at um, about uh, 51, 52 percent of the vote. And we're kind of stuck there. Okay, that's it. Close the polls. That's it. Okay, Bill, you better defend this bugger here. Uh, okay. What do you think uh, of the vote? Well, the the absolute unquestionable an right answer is one. It's RFQ and RFV are basically energy indices. So higher, more energy, higher RFQ and RFB. And those are so correlated, I'm just going to mention one of them. I'm not going to keep saying or the other one. This is actually totally wrong, different. High fiber almost always means lower RFQ, lower RFB, even though you, you buy forage for fiber. So high RFQ forages typically are lower in fiber. This protein thing is is kind of right. I'm going to talk about that. So I guess you could say um, if you pick this one, you're kind of right. But it's it's really energy. These are energy systems. I am going to address this protein in just a minute. But with forages, we have this thing called forage quality. We all know about better forage quality means more intake, more milk. And it, it's not just the nutrients. The, the energy value doesn't describe this completely. Fiber doesn't. It doesn't describe it completely. So that's why we need this adjuster for quality. And so how can we do this? Well, if you've been following a Sesame program, it's for forages, it was based on NDF. In other words, it said if alfalfa goes up in NDF, we expect a little more less milk, and it made an adjustment. And the same for grasses. For corn silage, it adjusts based on dry matter, thinking again, wet, very wet corn silage, they're going to eat less and less milk. And so this is okay. But NDF doesn't work with corn silage. NDF is not a good indices of, of corn silage quality. 
And there's still a ton of variation it doesn't account for. So that we have to do better. RFV mathematically is almost the same as NDF. So that doesn't do it. RFQ, which RFQ uses in vitro fiber digestibility, RFV just uses ADF and NDF. This accounts for additional variation because it has in vitro fiber digestion, but it's still, um, there's, we don't know the relationship between RFQ and milk production, so I can't put a price on it. And it probably doesn't work very well for corn silage, again, because NDF is not the best indices of intake for corn silage. In vitro is, but not NDF. I mentioned that RFQ or RFB kind of accounts for protein, but it accounts for a very little protein. This is data uh, Ralph Ward provided me out of Cumberland Valley for alfalfa. What you can look at is a 50 unit change, and, and again, RFV does almost the exact same thing. A 50 unit change in RFQ only changes protein on average by two units. So on average, high RFQ forages have less, have more protein than low ones, but it's very poorly correlated. The variation within an RFQ unit far exceeds the variation across RFQ. And what this means, if you're buying hay on RFV or RFQ, you could either be getting a good deal or you're getting screwed. Because again, it doesn't account for protein. On average, if you look at hay markets, about a 10 unit change in RFV yeah, equals $10, $10 a ton. That's of that ten dollars, two dollars of it is is protein. But within an RFQ unit, you could have as much as plus or minus twenty two dollars in protein in a ton. So your average RFV, you could actually be worth or a, a forage an alfalfa hay with average RFV could actually be worth twenty two dollars a ton more if you counted the protein if it was a high protein, or twenty two dollars or less. So if you're using RFV, you also have to add something for protein because there's so much variation in crude protein that RFV doesn't count. So another quick question here um, before we wrap this up. I'll let Mike take it over again. Okay, Bill, we'll get to vote one more time. A company is selling a forage that has low lignin. Uh, how would you adjust the price compared to a conventional forage? Abby, we have two more choice. Here's your last chance, girl. Uh, the first one is no adjustment. I'll just pay the same for both. Number two, I'm going to add 20% more to the price for the lower lignin forage. Number three, I'm going to use data from a research uh, study and adjust for it, probably whole, hopefully from the University of Illinois. Or number four, I'm going to use a lab a measurement of a fiber digestibility. So those are the four choices here, Abby. I got mine made up already. What are you gonna what are you gonna do? Here's your chance. Go double or nothing. I know you you've got me beat today. I am going with the fourth choice. Use a lab measurement to find out what the actual feed value is. What do you um, say? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote right with you again. And we got 54% in, so that's all it's voting today. 54 of you crooks are, are on board, the other four, 46 must be Republicans. Well, we'll move on. Jim, show us the results. Bill, what do you think of the answers? Uh, both the, the ones with the high numbers are acceptable. The, the Probably the better one, though, is the lab measure, because that can be applied into, to, to specific forages. The research data, you're still working with kind of average things. So ideally, it's a lab measure, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So what we've, we've looked at is, can we use in vitro fiber digestion to adjust the nutrient value of, of forages? And yes, the answer, I'll get cut to the quick, yeah, you can. It doesn't matter which one, but you have to be consistent. In other words, you can't compare forage one at 30 hours and price forage two at 48 hours. They have to be, be the same. And this is based, on, I'm sure you've seen this slide a million times. I'm just uh, gonna go quick here. This is based on uh, old studies of Mike Allen and then followed up by, by Oba again looking at a multitude of studies, just showing that as fiber digestion increased, intake increased in almost every study, there's a, a few exceptions, but in almost every study, and on average, the slope of these lines, 
was 0.26 pounds of intake for every unit of fiber digestion, which equates to about a half a pound of FCM. So what we came up with is you measure either one, again, it doesn't matter, just you have to be consistent across the standard and your samples. <clears throat> You get your measure for the forage, that's what I'm gonna call the sample. You compare it to the standard, which I'll define in a second. You add up or subtract. If the sample is worse than the standard, you'd subtract obviously, but you, you adjust for the pound, the expected change in milk production, the expected change in intake, put prices on these, convert to uh, uh, income over feed cost, and then convert to a ton. And I'll go through that math quickly here. The problem with this method is you need a standard. Our assumption is that the lab average you used is average forage. And then your sample will either be better or worse than average. And so we're, you, we price the nutrients based on the average, and then we adjust it. And again, right now, the only thing we have as a standard is the lab specific, and you have to use the same lab. These labs will differ. You use that, their mean, and most labs will provide you with the mean for NDF digestibility for the forage. So that's the standard. So I'll run through a quick example here. I'm going to, this is the alfalfa hay. This is the nutrient value. And we, we've gone through this calculation enough. But you sent it in, and at the 48 hours, it had a 54 fiber digestion. The lab I used had a mean of 47. So the difference was the sample minus the lab. So I, it's seven, so this is telling my forage is 7%, seven units better than average. That should give me three and a half pounds of milk above the average, but cows are gonna eat 1.8 pounds more feed than the average. The prices here I'm using is 18 milk, $10 feed. So the income when you do the math is 45 cents a day. But you have to put this on a ton basis. We're using 22 pounds inclusion. And the reason we do that is that was the mean of all those studies done by Oba and Allen. And so we had to do something. So 45 divided by 22 pounds times 1,700 pounds of dry matter per ton of alfalfa hay. Again, everything is on an as fed basis. That means this seven unit improvement here is worth $35 in quality. This is the expected increase in milk production and feed intake. So nutrients, 227, but I, I expect more out of this forage, $35 more. So it's actually worth 236. So that's how we would price uh, these forages. And you can do this with corn silage, or grass hay, gra uh, or silages. To make this simpler, we came up with a little table here with different milk prices, different feed prices. So you don't have to do all the math here and you can, you can go in between here, you can interpolate. A few things to notice, quality is worth a lot when milk is expensive and feed is cheap. Quality is still worth something, but it's worth less when milk is cheap and feed is expensive. But it's always a positive thing, but it's less positive when milk is cheap and feed is expensive. So you can use this table, here's just an example. Um, I'm gonna use $17 milk, $10 feed. So uh, the number is 5.4. In my example here, the test forage was five units lower, not higher, but lower than the mean. So it's a minus now, not a positive, minus five times the 5.4, that's minus 27. On a, on a as fed basis, it's minus 23. So I would take my forage, calculate the nutrient value and subtract $23 per ton. And that's what I'd be willing to pay plus or minus again, the, the variance for that hay. So this is a little easier than doing all, all that math. Uh, to wrap up here, there is some limits here. One is we assume 22 pounds inclusion. Likely the effect of quality depends on inclusion. So if, if you're feeding five pounds of hay, likely this effect of quality is less. It's still gonna be there, but it's likely gonna be less than what we're estimating. So on low inclusion rates, our method probably overestimates the importance of quality. 
We are assuming the response is the same for all herbs, but likely high producing herbs respond to quality more than low producing herbs. So high producing herbs, that's higher in vitro, probably worth more. Lower producing herbs, it's worth less. And then just a caution here, the data is based very heavy on alfalfa and corn. There's not, not much data for say small grain silage or grass silage. It, I think it would work, but again, the data is limited. So to wrap up here, we suggested you estimate the value of the feed based on nutrients and, and energy definitely, MP, forage NDF, as we get more advanced, the, the specific amino acids. You might have to make some adjustments for certain feeds. If you know a feed is better, and canola is a good example, it does better than we expect, make these adjustments based on expected changes in production. For forages, we think using in vitro NDF digestibility is a good way to adjust for these quality effects and for more or less uh, production based on quality. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to I think it goes to Abby now, I think. But thank you for yes, your attention. <laughs> yes, you got it. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for going through this presentation. I think this is a, a very interesting topic and kind of different than um, different than anything we've had you present on before. So thank you for digging into these numbers and sharing this information with our audience. Also, I would like to thank QLF Quality Liquid Feeds for their sponsorship of this program and helping us provide this educational opportunity to all of you. Um, if you would like to view this webinar again or any of our previous webinars, I will remind you that we have an archive on our website at www.hordes.com where you can find all of our past webinars and then this presentation, which will be posted later this week. We are wrapping up 2020 and looking forward to the year ahead, and we have another full slate of monthly webinars to provide for you in the upcoming year. Um, we'll start the year off on January 11th, and that presentation will be titled um, The Dairy Situation and Outlook for 2021, a presentation given by Mark Stevenson, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and that webinar will be sponsored by Cargill. And then our second presentation of the year will take place on February 8th, and that title webinar will be titled Mind Over Matter When Something is the Matter, and we have two presenters for that webinar, um, Amanda Stone from Mississippi State University and then Larry Trainel from Iowa State University Extension. So they will be diving into um, some of the health and wellness of people who are working on farms across the country and across the world. So look forward to both of those webinars and we hope you'll make plans to attend them. And at this point in the presentation, Mike, I will have you go through those pre-submitted questions and then we did have some questions that came in during the presentation. So anyone in the audience, if you want to submit a question still, you can do that. Please type it in the questions section of the GoTo control panel. Um, Mike, if you want to, please go through these questions. And Dr. Weiss, we look forward to hearing your answers. Yes, very good, Abby. Uh, this is a fairly complicated one as I read it to you. So we'll go to it, read it quickly. And Bill, hopefully you've been digesting it as it's been up on the screen. During the economic optimization of a ration, a software evaluates the, the interest price, the interest kind of, I think, of, of, of the product, uh, is in, incorporated or offered. This price strongly depends on the quantity, the quality of the description of the material and the constraints retained by the least cost optimizer. optimizer. Get that right? Should you, we, favor a book description to retain a new, potentially interesting raw material. Bill, good luck. Okay. Um, for for feeds, we don't know anything about. In other words, there there's not research saying we fed this and we get these response. You have to make the assumption that the feed will do what the nutrients, what we think the nutrients will do. So yes, you need need a good nutrient composition uh, of these new feeds. Know, protein on on MP. You know, ideally you're going to get some in situ data, but as as good of nutrient composition data as possible. And then you can either plug it into Sesame and get a get a, a price based on on nutrients, or you could put it into the um the to get to get the price per nutrients, and then you could use that price to put into your least cost optimizer. And again, the assumption is that it's going to do 
what the average feed with that nutrient composition does. You might, because it's uncertain, you know, I would put a limit on it, 10 or 20 percent, just in case it doesn't, the cows don't like it. But that would be, be the way to get good nutrient composition, get an estimated price based on the, the value of the nutrients, plug it into your least cost optimizer. Okay, let's go to our next question. Uh, Jim, if you can bring it forward, or there we go. This comes from Italy. I'm going to ask you the first one. I think you've answered it already. Is the Sesame software available, and is it available in metric units? Uh, I'll have to check on the metrics. I don't know. But I, I'll find out, but I gave you the link, and it is freely available anywhere in the world. Second part of this question from Italy, would you consider heat-treated soybean meal as an effective uh, replacement for the conventional soybean meal plus rumen-protected amino acids to balance that amino supply, uh, especially in close-up and fresh cow diets? Uh, would you consider this product comparison valid, meaning you're going to supplement the original soybean meal with amino acids versus the heat-treated product to improve milk protein synthesis? I think I got it interpreted correctly. This is a, a complicated question. And one is, you know, whether heat-treated soy and, and or, or regular soy plus amino acids can equal treated soy if you believe in the nutrient comp uh, the nutrient concept yeah we should be able to make that work um, if we have good data whether it's economic is a totally different question and that that you'd have to check this is something where you'd use a least cost optimizer or a least cost program plug in the RP amino acids with conventional soy compare it to, to treat it but I think you could could make conventional in fact I think there's a lot of data showing conventional soy plus amino acids does quite well. Um, but when you get into this question about close up and fresh cows, now this is where this becomes much more difficult because you know theoretically close up cows don't need methionine. They do not need supplemental methionine. We should be able to get that cheap enough from conventional feeds. There's a lot of research out there showing that a little bit of uh, RP methionine, rumen protect methionine during this close-up period does lots of things. It improves health, it may improve production. It does things, uh, again, these are, we don't understand exactly why. The nutrient value does not count in health. There's no, no value for improving the health. This is one of these adjustments you have to make. So it's very unlikely, I think, with the current systems that RP methionine or RP amino acids would, would pencil in on close-up cows. That doesn't mean they're not very valuable, it just means we can't price them. And with fresh cows, a, a big problem here with fresh cows is, with these things, is carryover effects. We've done research, other people have done research, that where you feed a, a diet for the first couple weeks, that response, get a nice positive response, but that response continues after they're, they're put on a common diet. That we can't price again. So for fresh cows and close-ups, I'm going to say the, the nutritionist has to be very much involved. You can't just rely on uh, computer-generated prices. The milk protein synthesis thing here, again, is if this has been shown based on research that X grams of RP methionine generates X dollars in milk protein, you have to add that in to the nutrient value. So uh, some of this we can do, but some of it you, is still the nutritionist has to sit down and think, yeah, the health is worth X amount of dollars or so on. So I, I can't really answer everything. Just be aware of this for close-ups and fresh cows. It's much more difficult than just nutrient value. Okay, let's go to our last question that came in from Arizona. And it says, I think you've answered part of this already. What about dry distillers grains with cybles? Uh, can I use 10% uh, to uh, aiming for increasing the bypass in the protein and can we replace soybean meal with DDGs? Yeah, I think there's, there's a fair database out there that at good distillers at reasonable inclusion rates is a very effective feed ingredient. 10% uh, to me is a, is a quite reasonable inclusion rate. You have some, some distillers are very high in sulfur. You got to watch that. Some are very high in fat, unsaturated fat. You have to watch that. But in general, I think you can put together very good and, and less costly diets with some distillers. 
I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to say you can replace all the soybean meal with distillers because, you know, soybean meal is a good blend of amino acids and so on, but you definitely can replace some of it with distillers. Just remember, inclusion rate matters, and if you get too high, likely it will be uh, negative on production in it. Okay, we're going to go to the speed round now. By the way, we do have a clarification from two different people, and that sesame does come in metric units from two yeah. two people, Thanks. so the answer Thanks. is yes, it, it does. So at least, Bill, uh, we got one right. We got that one yeah. right. Okay, to the speed round. Let's go uh, here to the top, Jim, and let's go right to the, the first one that came in here. Uh, Dr. Weiss, would you comment on the challenges of pricing alfalfa versus grass, particularly the challenge of dealing with relative intake potential differences between those two types of forages? Yeah, that's that's always been tough. Um, and grass is 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 you know good good quality grass in a well balanced diet intake is 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 as good it can't be the same you cannot feed the same ndf from grass as alfalfa and that's where this this uh forage ndf comes in place so if you balance for forage ndf with high quality grass you're going to feed less grass than alfalfa because it has higher fiber but we expect similar intakes similar um uh milk production so if part of this is just in formulation. Then the the other thing here with grasses is again, it's good grass has very high in vitros, typically higher than alfalfas, and that's where I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to say that the value of higher in vitro for a grass is worth as much as higher in vitro for alfalfa. Remember, there's not a lot of data. I don't think there's actually any data in those comparisons. So we might be overvaluing the, the, the effect of increased in vitro fiber digestion with grasses. It's, it's there, I don't, say, no, I don't mean to say it's not important, but we might be overvaluing. But forage or fiber from grass is, is fine, but you have to use it on a forage NDF basis for, for good grass. If it's low quality grass, then it has very limited value in dairy cattle. Uh, can you ever make liquid molasses uh, products justified in a dairy TMR, probably based on price? What's your take on that? I, I think you can. And part of the problem is, is you know, if you look at the data with sugars, the Sesame program doesn't value sugar; it values the energy. But if you look at some of the, and this, some of this was out of USDA in, in Wisconsin, some added sugar generated more milk and more, I, I can't remember on intake, but clearly more milk than, than the starch, even though the, the digestibility, the two are gonna be very similar, the energy values are gonna be similar. So this again is where if you can look at the expected response from added sugar and you price in sugar, and you can do this, you have to put in the sugar concentration of all the feeds and then the price, or you can just say sugar is worth, I'm making this number up, because of expected increases in milk, uh, a ton of sugar is worth $25 extra or whatever. And again, that's a made up number above what it is for energy. So you, you have to price it in addition to nutrients, then you have to give it kind of a bonus because that energy is coming from sugar. Okay, what is the best replacement for soybean meal? How's, how's that for a question? Well, uh, a cheap source of protein. Um, you know, a lot of the canola, again, is it actually looks a little bit better on a dry matter basis. Cotton seed meal can work. I think it's probably a little worse than soybean meal. All the oil seeds generally can work pretty well. You have some of them have a lot of fiber because they blend stuff back in, so you have to watch them. But the oil seeds, seed meals are similar, um, not exactly the same, but are similar. You can use some distillers, uh, some corn gluten feed to get some, but again, you be, have to be cautious here of, of all this corn protein. You know, if, because you're probably feeding corn size, you're probably feeding corn grain, and then if all your protein comes from corn corn based products, likely you're going to not get optimal production. But you can definitely use some. So think about gluten feed, think about some distillers, but I still would keep an oilseed meal. Uh, in in some oilseed meal in the diet. 
Next question has to do with polycrops. Uh, I think he's referring to these new cocktails that we see coming here on, on, on farms showing up. Uh, do, is the quality analysis uh, the same for these kind of crops? Uh, this could be, you know, some of your your grasses and, and some of the, the other uh, uh, cocktail mixtures that show up uh, in, in, uh, in, on farms. Um, I, the, the short answer and quick answer is I don't know. However, if you, if you look at some of this stuff in general, I'd say they do about what we expect them to do. So I, I would say my, my best guess would be, I think the, the method I described would work. You get a complete an analysis so you can get a good energy estimation. The MP value I think would work. The conversion for that would be reasonable. The effect of in vitro NDF digestibility, I think, would be similar. I won't say it's going to be the same, but it'd be similar. So I think you can get a reasonable approximation of its value using the, the method I described. But you do need, because these mixtures can be extremely variable, you do need a real chemical analysis. I would not trust uh, book values for these for these forage mixtures. I think you've answered this question, but it is, is animal health taken into account in changing the diet? It definitely has to be, but it's not right now in these pricing systems. So this again is where the nutritionist is not going to be replaced by a computer. We can, for example, we can price DCAD. You can say, okay, if we feed DCAD, we expect X amount less milk fever. Milk fever has been, been valued, so we can do it for some of these. But a lot of this stuff, just general health, that, that we can't price. So that's the nutritionist's job is to say, I think feeding compound X, we get less ketosis. It's a, it's a, it's a good deal. That's their, they have to make that call or you have to make that call. Uh, what about substituting uh, that $4 and 40 cents a bushel corn and probably going higher because of China purchases by other cheaper feedstuffs? Can I substitute other things for this expensive corn uh sure it's you know cows do not have a corn requirement they don't have a soya requirement they don't have an alfalfa requirement so look look at and and this is where sesame would be a good thing where you'd look at okay these are our cheaper sources of energy um but it's got to fit so yeah you can um again distillers at a limited inclusion that it's a high energy fee that can pull some corn out some of these byproducts are, they're not as high in energy as corn, but they can be used. Uh, barley, wheat, et cetera. Some of these are not necessarily going to be cheap enough, but use sesame and, and look for high energy feeds if they're cheaper than corn. But cows do not need corn. Very good, Bill. Um, Abby, we'll turn it back to you to kind of wrap up. Uh, and, and I think we've got all the questions answered. Thank you. We did. Thank you very much. Dr. Weiss, thank you for going through all those questions and providing more insight on this topic and also for your presentation today. Um, very, very interesting. And we are um, thankful that you took time to be with us today. Also, want to thank QLF for sponsoring this webinar. We thank them for their support of our educational opportunity provided to our audience today. I want to remind you that we are kicking off the new year with a presentation on January 11th. Um, it's a dairy situation and outlook. Outlook, more specifically titled um, Pandemic Prices and PPDs, What Will 2021 Offer? So please join us at um, noon central time on the 11th of January to hear that presentation from Mark Stevenson. And then in February on the 8th, we'll have a presentation titled Mind Over Matter, When Something Is the Matter, presented by Amanda Stone and Larry Trainel. So please mark your calendar to join us for those presentations. And then finally, as we approach the end of 2020, I want to thank you all for joining us to um, for joining us for this year's webinar series, whether you join us for a month or all 12 of them. I hope these presentations have been useful to you, and we look forward to providing more webinars for you in the upcoming year. From all of us here at Horde Steerman and our team at the University of Illinois, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year, and we look forward to meeting with you again in 2021.